Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Mustos. Thank you, Zach, and welcome everyone to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we together explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's very special guest, what is something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? I was looking at our Duck Duck Goose exhibit and discovered duck banding. For nearly 100 years, waterfowl scientists have used it to um, track the patterns of migration, is the word I was looking for there. And it is especially interesting because when um, hunters uh, shoot a duck with duck banding, that is uh, a thing that they hang on to the band and they report you know that where the duck was and say so it really is an interesting uh, part of both conservation and waterfowl hunting so Sometimes thank it even you it takes several years for that to happen i know well i was very curious and how you know and and i never got the answer to this but i was curious what is the oldest you know did someone get one with the duck that was like somehow 10 years old you know i would like to know the oldest duck that was found from banding. Will you look into that for us? I will us? look into that. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so today's special guest is conservationist Bob Ford. We're going to talk all about uh, the Hatchie River. Welcome, Bob. So what, what's been going on with you? Let's see. I left. I retired Fish and Wildlife Service okay. uh, about two years ago now. Okay. And I'd put in 23 years with them, uh, as you well know, 14 years in two different gigs, 14 years total in Washington, D.C., and then yeah. worked. Managed to stay in Tennessee, but worked for the regional office a fair amount. Then since I retired, I knew I wasn't ready to quit working, so I started a wildlife consulting business. And okay. Got a, got a few, uh, few contracts out. The big one is a part-time executive director of Hatchie River Conservancy. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about that. Um, <clears throat> before we do, let's back all the way up and talk a little bit about where you grew up and things like that. I do know that I should also mention to listeners who maybe um, – aren't aware that your wife is Martha Lawford, who was on episode 109 of Real Foot Forward back as the director of Center of Faith and, and Imagination at Memphis Theological Seminary. So go back and listen to uh, Martha Lyle. And full disclosure, she and I, my grandfather and her grandfather, no, my grandfather and her grandmother were nephew and aunt. So I don't know exactly what that makes us, but um, <clears throat> I know that I have been aware of, of uh, her family for, you know, my whole life. Um, so where did you grow up? I grew up in Memphis, in South Memphis. You oh. know, in the time I could uh, ride my bike down to a woodlot or a grassland, and I spent a lot of time outdoors there. My father was a big outdoorsman. Okay. So we had a lot of time hunting and fishing on the Oxbow Lakes right mm -hmm. off the Mississippi River and on the Mississippi River. Traveled up to the Hatchie occasionally to go hunting and fishing. Now, for people who are not from around here, um, the Mississippi River runs along uh, the side of the state. Um, and a lot of tributaries flow into it and have for decades and decades since, since you know, thousands and thousands of years. I know this is your area of expertise, but... Um, you know, it's uh, a big part of the environment here from the very beginning. You're right, Scott. Those tributaries have shaped not just the landscape, but the culture of all the people who have ever, ever set foot in this part of the world. There's Ilbaum Fork of Deer, which is right up here close to Discovery Park. Starting at the, at the southern end, there's the Wolf River and Lusahatchee. And running pretty much through the central part of West Tennessee, first north and then curves west, to the Mississippi River is the Hatchie River. And the Hatchie is the last unchannelized, unmanipulated tributary to the, to the Mississippi River in the entire lower Mississippi River Basin. Now, you just said something that I think you can help me figure out. Um, so my wife and I were driving by somewhere where we saw the sign, and, and I said, Fork a Deer, you know, and my wife said, why is it not Fork to Deer? And I said, you know, I don't know. It just popped out of my mouth. Is it? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy, you're going to have to ask Martha Lyle back, my wife, to answer that question because we get into that same discussion all the time. So for, forked deer is really what it probably grammatically would be. but a Grammatically deer, is correct. If people say forked deer river. Forked deer, forky deer. 
Yeah. yeah I've heard it a lot, a couple of different ways. Yeah. I usually say fork a deer. Yeah. And that yeah. comes back just from the original, you know, folks who, who were, um, on it. Um, so you, Picked up the bug from your dad of being outdoors, of being on the water, um, and of um, and of hunting and fishing and all that. Um, at what point did you decide to choose that as your career? Well, I go back to Martha Lyle here real quick. She tells me repeatedly how lucky I am that at 12 years old, I knew I wanted to be a wildlife biologist, and I knew I wanted to study birds. And in high school, I started watching all all kinds of birds. I linked up with the uh, Tennessee Ornithological Society chapter in Memphis, and they showed me some birds my freshman year at then Memphis State University, now University of Memphis. I talked to the professor and let me take an upper-level class of ornithology, study the study of birds, and I was hooked on birds ever since. It's like my eyes opened to all the diversity of birds and what those birds' habitats are. So I went to I went a couple of years to Memphis State, then I moved to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville for a degree in wildlife, uh, fish and wildlife management, then stayed there for a master's degree in wildlife biology. And since then, I've worked a wide range of, of uh, organizations. I did some uh, consulting work for forest industry, worked for nonprofits, the Nature Conservancy, and Tennessee's affiliate to the National Wildlife Federation, worked with the state of Tennessee, worked 23 years with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, federal government, and all of it has been focused on primarily bird conservation. And if I had a specialty, I'd say it's uh, forestry and birds. How do we sustain forest management, get good economy for landowners and industry? But we can do that in such a way, right, where bird populations thrive. So that's that's the area where I live, you know, is helping make that connection. So um, at what point – I guess right away in college, they start talking when you're in that area. I was in journalism and advertising, so we didn't talk a lot about birds over there. Um, you um, you must immediately be- begin learning about the conflict between business and industry and conservation and how to navigate those two areas. My first class at the University of Tennessee – in wildlife biology, the first thing the professor said was, if you want this job because you want to manage 40,000 acres with your dog, that's not going to happen. <laughs> wildlife management is people management. Mm. And that's that's stuck with me, and that's definitely been most people's career in wildlife conservation. It's not necessarily conflict. I don't want to, don't want to focus on the conflict part, but people use and enjoy the outdoors. They enjoy wildlife in lots of different ways. Bird watching is – Bird watching and wildlife photography are two of the fastest growing outdoor recreation sports. They're up up in the top three most years. So, you know, having quality, sustainable wildlife, fish and wildlife populations so that people can enjoy those populations in the outdoors is very important. Well, and um, obviously we're right here next to Real Foot Lake. So I know a lot of, they have Pelican Festival and, you know, there's a lot of bird watching that happens there. Um, my wife and I now live out in the country and we have the whole section behind our house that we haven't mowed and we've just been letting it grow up and let whatever happens, happens. It's crazy. The different, all the different birds, you know, oh, that we right. have in this area and the different times of the year where there are different, different types of birds. So this whole region is uh, a really great place for bird watching. I'm it, assuming it is. It is rich in bird life. Um, more or less, uh, the, I'll go back to the Hatchie watershed here, but uh, along the Hatchie River and in the watershed, there are over 250 species of birds that occur over the course of the year. You know, in the winter, we get waterfowl and, and all the winter birds, if birds uh, like white-throated sparrows or juncos that come here from Canada and the Northeast to spend our winters. And then in the summer, we get birds from the tropics to come here and nest like most of the warblers and the wood thrush and the tanagers. So, um, I do what, what little I do know, and you can fill in the blanks for me. Uh, and and I did I, I went and did a little research. I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. But um, so, not that long ago, the government felt like the meandering streams were bad for farmland. And so they tried to straighten all the channels, which really became an 
a disaster when it comes to conservation and the ecology of this area. Can you talk a little bit about that for us? Yeah, sure will, Scott. That was in the 1960s. Um, there was a big push, uh, Secretary of Agriculture at the time, uh, and before he became Secretary, Earl Butts, was very much into efficient agriculture, and that meant big lands where you didn't have to turn your tractor around too many times, didn't have to go around too many fence rows. But that also included lands that were traditionally flooded, the floodplain, the, the wetlands we now know are, are so important to us. So these rivers we're talking about are broad, occur in broad floodplains, and they meander big, big bends and big curves all across that floodplain. So when we talk about the tributaries like the Hatchie to the Mississippi River, we can't think of just the river itself. We have to think of that entire floodplain. So in the 60s, a lot of that's great land. It's great farmland. It's great forest land. Uh, to get water off of that, those broad meanders were cut into a straight line. And the straight line became the river, the main channel of the water. And that channel took the water off faster, what would be productive farmland. And so that process was called channelization. And the Hatchie River is the last unchannelized, unmanipulated river in the lower Mississippi River Valley. And as I understand it, they also made them deeper so they didn't flood anymore. Deeper and big levees on both sides, right. And so uh, not only, you know, it damaged uh, the areas where, because we are in the Mississippi Flyway, that the birds that would land here, you know, and, and be here for a season – um, didn't weren't doing that anymore because there was no more there was no more place for them to live. That's right. And in the 1960s, 1968 specifically, a lot of people were beginning to realize that. And let me tell you this story, Scott. You're going to appreciate this. I think um, in 1968, the state representative for this part of Tennessee was Bill Walker. Uh, he later became commissioner of agriculture in Tennessee. He later became deputy commissioner under Secretary Butts at the University of, I mean, at the uh, Department of Agriculture federally. But there was a big push. Most streams were being channelized at the time through the 1960s. And the Hatchie starts with two tributaries coming out of North Mississippi, the Little Hatchie and the Tuscumbia. And those uh, form the head of the Hatchie River close to Pocahontas in McNary County, Tennessee, south of Jackson. Well, the legislator and the folks in Mississippi channelized the two creeks that come to make the Hatchie. Mm. And there was a hard push from Mississippi farmers to Tennessee farmers mm. and some push in Tennessee to channelize the Hatchie. Bill Walker, our state representative at the time, stepped up and said, no, as much as I'm into agriculture, as much as I support agriculture, the Hatchie is too important to be channelized. He introduced the legislation that made it a state scenic river. Our Tennessee state scenic river law had just passed, mm. and he made he made the legislation work bipartisan across all people. All everyone agreed with the prop, uh, with the proposition. It became a state scenic river in 1970, primarily to prevent that channelization from happening. And the result has been uh, a scenic river that's now just priceless in terms of its ecological and scenic values. Well, and and for folks who are listening who don't know anything about the who've never been to the Hatchie, who don't you know who live in California because we do have listeners who are from everywhere. Um, I'm going to play just a short clip of you on the Hatchie. Uh, that's on YouTube, and we'll put a link down in the show notes. But here's a little bit of you talking about the Hatchie as you're actually paddling down it. Today we're on the Hatchie River on Earth Day 2020. Hatchie River is a special resource, a national treasure really right here in northern Mississippi and West Tennessee. Hatchie is nearly 240 miles long, river miles. Starts in northern Mississippi, flows north into Tennessee, slowly starts to curve northwest, then around the central part of West Tennessee, it turns west, and, and all this water goes straight into the Mississippi River, Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. This river is a 
is a swamp river, at least that's what I call it. Slow moving, meandering, very broad floodplain. Carries a lot of water during some times of the year. Less water in the mid late summer. Important ecological aspect about this river is that the river is not just what you see in front of you, not just the main stem, but the river itself, a lot of ecologists, including myself, would include the bottomland hardwood forest and the floodplain because flooding is a natural part of this system. It's an important part of this system. It regenerates wetlands, water quality, provides rich soil for forests, wildlife. This river itself is, is much broader than what you see here. Some places the river floodplain forest can be a mile wide on the Hatchie. Okay, so the Hatchie River is not like a fast stream that you can inner tube down, correct? You really need to paddle. <laughs> correct. You don't have to paddle like on calm water, but but the current is slow and steady. Um, you know, it, it's a broad meandering river. And so really the scenic values and the ability to float and get up under the shade when it's hot in the summer and see birds and see wildlife, watch the trees and see the trees and identify trees. Um, that's the real value of, of the float on the Hatchie. You're right. It's not it's not a river like the buffalo a lot of people around here would know the buffalo a, a clear water stream that moves pretty fast you can get in there you put in the, and, on an inner tube a bus takes you and you get on and then they pick you up at the other side or, or whatever right right but it's a very very user-friendly river to paddle and a beautiful river in fact um, there's a um, outfitter in memphis called blue city kayak which is now hosting a third saturday float every month of the year you can look them up and, and get a, get in with the float on them. There's The guides are expert. They are certified river canoe and kayak leaders as well as uh, first aid expertise. I'm going to write that down. What is it? Blues City Kayak. Yeah. Okay. We're going to put them a link to them in the show notes as well because I was going to ask you, you know, I don't have my own kayak. I'm not a, yeah. you know, I like to be outdoors, but I'm not a big, uh, you know, kayaker. Yeah. Where, you know, how can I experience the Hatchie River? And so through these folks is a great way for somebody to get started and experience it. Is there, are there time periods where this happens is there a time when well the hatchie is too high or too low and you can't do anything yes yes i very much watch the river gauges at, at each of the areas where they the sections of river they plan to float and if the river's too high they won't get on it and we keep a pretty close eye on how low it is too it's not dangerous when it's low but it is um it can be not a fun float you know and it's dangerous uh, when it's high because it goes too fast or it goes pretty fast um the danger is that the Hatchie River can, when it's high, can often flood across the floodplain forest, right? And so there's essentially no bank. And when you're out there and if you are an experienced in a kayak and you fall over, uh, you need to find a sandbar or something mm. to get back in, right? Yeah. And that, and if you fall over in high water, you can still find a shallow spot, but it's a little bit tricky. Now, how about for bird watchers? Is there a spot along the Hatchie that is like the prime place where you want to go to watch for birds there's lots of places lots of places but there's two national wildlife refuges in the hatchy watershed one is in haywood county about twelve thousand acres of bottomland hardwood forest river uh, hatchy river flows through it um, it's got some upland forests on the backside and, and grasslands that are managed for native warm season grasses and that's an excellent place to and a great watch. walking trail if somebody isn't you know if somebody isn't wanting to get their feet dirty there's That's a right. really great walking trail there that right, I've walked on. Right where the office is uh, in a, a small visitor center, there's a uh, graveled road around O'Neill Lake, mm -hmm. and that's exactly two miles. So it's for a lot of people like myself, it's almost the perfect walking distance to be able to kind of stroll along and watch birds and get a good sense of the refuge. When I was there, there were cranes and, you know, ducks and, you know, all different types of waterfowl mm -hmm. um, that were flying around, you know, yeah, it was fun yeah. to see. 
you know, since you're here close to Real Foot, Scott, um, you see bald eagles all the time, I mm-hmm. bet. But we have nesting pairs at the Hatchie National Wildlife Refuge now, so it's not unusual to see them on O'Neill Lake. Oh, nice. And during spring migration, we have a Hatchie Bird Fest in mm-hmm. Haywood County, and then there's now a Tipton County Bird Fest that's in both uh, Tipton County and Lauderdale. Okay. I should mention the other refuge, too. The Lower Hatchie National Wildlife Refuge is right at the mouth of the Hatchie on the Mississippi River. Okay. It's primarily managed for waterfowl, so a good bit of it is closed during the winter for waterfowl sanctuary. But there's a big lookout tower where you can watch all these ducks and geese and hawks and eagles uh, during the winter, and it's an open the rest of the year where you can get down the Mississippi River, and there's Baltimore Orioles and the Cottonwoods and all kinds of cool stuff. Excellent. So, as you mentioned, the Hatchie's been here a long time. I was curious. I used my newspapers.com account to check out, you know, things about the Hatchie from history. And it's it's interesting how you can go back uh, in 2001. So it's 20, almost 25 years ago. Saving the Hatchie was a topic. Um, so you were around 25 years ago. Were you around? Were you helping this cons- the conservancy group try to help preserve the beauty and remind people of how important the Hatchie was then? I was. I was indeed. Um, I, I actually moved to a different job and into the Washington, D.C. area for the first time as that was starting. But I helped kick it off. Um, there were and, and a lot of the issues remain the same. Things are better. But a lot of the. Uh, issues for the river itself remain the same. Sedimentation in the river is still a major problem, and and we'll address that in our new Hatchie River Conservancy as well. So what was going on um, at this time? You mentioned the sediments. Why were the sediments building up? And, you know, what was going on back then that needed to be addressed? Uh, Back then, 25 years ago, there was not as much no-till farming. No-till farming was just beginning to get Uh, into the agricultural community Mm -hmm. so it was growing slowly but we wanted to help promote that in order to keep the erosion from entering the tributaries to the hatchie Mm -hmm. and the hatchie itself is buffered for the most part from a lot of that the changes that have happened um no-till farming is set it's hard to find a field i hadn't seen a field in years that hadn't been no-till and cover crops in the winter etc yeah and what's funny is we talk about that in our exhibit on innovation and agriculture after we do this podcast we'll walk out there and yeah. um look, look at some some of that but um yeah that that was a really that was a game changer it um, was it was so it's a lot area. better now i, yeah. I will absolutely Thank the agricultural community and the Nature Conservancy and all those who helped put that in place. Now the issue is the tributaries to the Hatchie themselves are eroding from the bottom and from the sides. Mm. So sides of these creeks coming into the Hatchie are falling into the bottom of those creeks. Mm -hmm. Then floodwaters will Mm. take that sediment right out to the Hatchie. Mm. So we're working on ways to uh, recover, help rehabilitate some of the creeks that come to the Hatchie to help slow down that sedimentation. If you go back to 1995, show pride and save the Hatchie River. Um, This article says the slowly dying Hatchie River is proof that man's interference with nature's way can lead to disaster. So even back in 1995, I was looking to see if I could see who this was by, um, but it isn't. But anyway, so there was there was issues going on. Keep going back. So 1981, you and I are about the same age. So you were probably about to graduate from high school or? Just had graduated, right? So just hit me too. So um, there was an article in 1981, Hatchie's Fate May Become a Rallying Point, that was talking about the upcoming pending disaster if we didn't get our act together of the Hatchie River and... Um, if you keep going all the way back, and I didn't, I did this like in five minutes this morning, so I haven't done there a ton of research, but all the way back to 1879. Now, I know that you and you nor I was around in, in uh, 1879, but there was, um, uh, there's an article I ran across on um, the Big Hatchie. Uh, one of the arteries of Memphis commerce that has long been closed by which the rich farming districts of West Tennessee have been at the mercy of railroad, railroad monopolies. So the railroad 
had tried to shut down transportation on the Hatchie to force people to use the railroad. And it was really interesting um, to read about how the cotton was carried, you know, transported on the Hatchie. And it was a really important part of uh, Tennessee, the Tennessee economy. You're right about that. You're right. A lot of people don't realize that um, steamboats and side wheelers used to come up the Hatchie as far as almost to the headwaters at Bolivar, Tennessee. And interesting you should bring that up. On our Hatchie River Conservancy website, we just posted a blog a couple of days ago about a wreck, a steamboat wreck that's, I say steamboat, hold that. It's a, it's a boat wreck hmm. on the Hatchie. And it was discovered in the uh, local historian and a state uh, archaeologist historian examined the site. And there's no evidence of ma- machinery. There's no steamboat no nothing so there's a there's the thought that it was a side wheeler mm. somewhere could be as far back as the civil war that had come wow. up and carried probably troops or had carried uh, equipment or maybe after the war or during the war even um, helped get cotton out out to the mississippi river well and i'm guessing a lot of flatboats went up and down the hatchie or maybe just down or just up whatever <laughs> i'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. guessing there were a lot there was a lot of transportation of flat boats at the time as well right. um we're going to take a quick break and when we get back i want to hear about the new efforts to make sure the hatchies around for years to come musto's pasta and grill is a family-owned restaurant serving paris dyersburg and union city for over a decade Their diverse menu of authentic Italian dishes includes everything from savory pasta and sandwiches to fresh salads. The next time you visit Discovery Park, check out their brand new Union City restaurant at 2205 West Real Foot Avenue. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Bob Ford, and we're talking all about the Hatchie River. Uh, This has been fascinating. Um, Bob, tell me a little bit about what's going on now. Um, we obviously just talked all about, you know, since 1879, and probably if I kept going, there's even, you know, more articles about the Hatchie. It's a really important part of our history and, and our present as well, um, especially for people who are into conservation and bird watching and fishing and outdoor sports. And um, talk a little bit about the new uh, initiatives that have come together to protect um, the Hatchie. There are several core core to those of the organization of which I'm the director, Hatchie River Conservancy. And the origins of that were last fall in uh, uh, 2023. A friend and I were biking on the Hatchie National Wildlife Refuge and watching birds. And we realized that the Ford Company, Ford Motor Company in Blue Oval City is coming into Haywood County. There's rapid urbanization in around Bolivar, Hardeman County, Tipton County the same. And so... There have been, as you said, there's lot, been lots of efforts over the years to conserve the Hatchie, and each of those efforts have made significant progress. So what's different now? I think the realization that the Hatchie watershed is going to change and become more and more urban and less and less rural, I firmly believe it will remain rural is a broad definition, but there's going to be a lot more people in the watershed, and a lot more people in the watershed potentially has impact on the Hatchie River. So my friend and I said, we, let's give it a try. We need a nonprofit group. As all the development's happening, as all the new industries coming in, we want economic growth. It's great, great progress. We want infrastructure, new restaurants, all of that's coming. Love it. We all love it. But who's speaking for the Hatchie? And we decided to start this nonprofit we launched in January of this year. The Hatchie River Conservancy. You can go to HatchieRiver.org or follow us on Facebook, Hatchie River Conservancy, and see what we're all about. Our primary mission is to conserve the ecological integrity and the scenic values of the Hatchie River and its watershed. So it's, again, it's not just the river itself. It's the, it's the watershed and the impacts that come into the floodplain from the surrounding watershed. And we also firmly believe and agree with that the Hatchie watershed is a working landscape. There's forestry, there's agriculture, there's industry, there's lots of ways people are making a living, lots of ways people are enjoying the environment and the outdoors. So we recognize that. And we are 
firm belief that we can have a growing economy as well as conserve the Hatchie River. Is there anybody just dumping tons of sludge into the Hatchie River? No, no. There are a couple of sites that are worth looking into. Uh, one around Toon, Tennessee, has been a, an issue for a number of years. Um, but the main issue, I think, is uh, – I and others are not so much worried about specific industry. You know, sometimes they may make a mistake and sometimes, and they will definitely help clean that up when they do. But the increase in the number of people, and, and where I live, Scott, the population is estimated to double. So about 18,000 now could be up to 40,000 in 10, 15 years. Where those people live and how those communities are developed and how all the restaurants and the shopping malls and the support from those people, how they're built is what's critical because the cumulative impact of all the runoff. Say, think about a new suburb or a new community of 30 houses, 30 houses that have lawns, 30 houses that have, um, you know, cleaning cars and, and pesticides. pesticides on their lawns. Exactly. And all of that if it's not done correctly, it could run straight into the hatchie. And that's those are the issues we're trying to get ahead of primarily is how do we plan growth so that we can conserve the values that we most most cherish. Now, I'm assuming that there are uh folks in Nashville that are that are planning uh to protect the hatchie with regulation and that that we can count on um our father the government to take good care of us. <laughs> Well, you said the R word, but no, I think, uh, just kidding. The, uh, <laughs> it's not so much regulation, but cooperative management and collaboration. Right. Uh, the folks I work to work with in Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, uh, Tennessee Department of Tourism, we're all trying to work together so that the conservation of the Hatchie can happen. Um, the Hatchie River Conservancy, along with our partners, Tennessee Wildlife Federation, Tennessee Department of uh, Tourism, and the Southwest Development District, just put in a grant for capacity from the National Park Service to help us plan for a Blue Ways project. So the we got it. So we have capacity, a person who can stick with us for several months and help us with planning recreation, outdoor recreation around the river. One of the Hatchie River Conservancy's <clears throat> primary tenets, one of our areas of work, is to promote low-impact recreation. Right now, there's uh, a lot of people use the river with john boats to hunt, fish, float. A lot of people are increasingly using the river with kayaks and canoes. People are getting in the river banks, you know, on the on public lands. I mean, you distracted me a while ago when you said you were on there with your bike because I love to bike. So uh, you there know, you go. so right, there's exactly. biking there as well. The Hatchie National Wildlife Refuge has miles of gravel road that are perfect for mountain biking and watching wildlife uh, or, or re any kind of bike, re re really. But the uh, gravel roads, probably a wider tire is better. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, a lot of, lot of increase in people watching the river and the, or being on the river in the surrounding area. So the state is very much involved in trying to help us plan access to the river in a way that that we maintain the important values of the Hatchie, which includes some solitude, you know, some some areas where you don't want to see anybody else the rest of the day. So how do we plan river access and areas so that you can go in a group, you can go by yourself and, and have the kind of quality experience that you want? So someone like me who's a, t a novice um, is the um, floodplain owned by individuals or is it owned by the government or what's the the uh, arrangement there yeah the floodplain is privately owned okay. um just a just a broad statement but uh and generally the water laws in tennessee um if you're in the river channel you're okay but anywhere off the river channel and it's potentially privately owned unless it's national wildlife refuge for example publicly owned and, and you can figure that out but Hatchie has a lot of landowners and a lot of people who are passionate about the river and the floodplain. So if I'm a soybean farmer and I've been raising soybeans and I pass away and leave my land to my kids and, you know, what is to keep someone from selling a big chunk of land 
to a uh, huge car wash um, and and a mall, a strip mall, you know, and then, you know, without really a care for what it does to uh, the environment. Right. There's no um, no hard and fast regulations to prevent that if it's. You know, the basic things, you know, if it doesn't have endangered species or if it's not in a wetland, et cetera. But, you know, if private land and it's not in a wetland, there's nothing really to stop that except the goodwill and the uh, interest of the community about the hatchie. Right. Of, of which is great. But somebody who comes in from out of town to build Acme Car Wash, you know, probably doesn't really give two hoots about uh, West Tennessee or, or the hatchie. Um, so that's what we really have to be watching out for i would think absolutely um hatchie i mentioned promote promotion of uh low impact outdoor recreation is one of our areas of work at hatchie river conservancy another area of work is dramatically increase education about the river communication about the river the importance of the river and to build a network of people who care about the river and we're moving well on that hatchyriver.org or facebook uh, you can follow us but we have to have a network of concerned citizens who can voice that, who can watch for that, who can help try to prevent that. You know, there's there are also alternatives to um, to that kind of development in terms of if we get ahead of the curve, maybe maybe the state or federal government could match that price. And instead of selling it to Acme Car Wash, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, sell it to a refuge or a state park or even a county park, a local park. What do, what do you know, this great country of ours is full of. Um, conservation areas and you know thanks to Teddy Roosevelt there's lots of uh, force and you know what do places like in Colorado and Montana and I I know they have a lot of similar they must have a lot of similar uh, rivers and tributaries and how do they protect theirs regulation Uh, there's usually a um, an agreed upon community plan Uh those plans set certain parameters based on the values of that community they want a certain buffer around a creek. They want a park around a creek. They want this area over here to be industry. They want that area over there to be community. They want this part of the county to be a, uh, the town hall in the, in the center, of, center of community. And once they pass those plans, they stick to them and have regulations uh, to enforce them. And in a lot of areas, that's not true across all states. But in Tennessee, uh, the we have plans, but they don't carry a stick, basically. And so worst case scenario, I'm, I have no doubt that the best case scenario is going to happen. But, you know, what do we need to fear? What does it look like, you know, when somebody sits here and, and adds, they'll add today to this stack of newspaper articles that I have, you know, what, what happens 30 years from now if people don't pay attention I think that what happens is it becomes an urban river. It becomes, uh, you know, Memphis is growing in the Hatchie River direction. Jackson is growing in the Hatchie River direction. Uh, urban development is is coming. There's no doubt about it. So in 30 years, unplanned urban development would mean that at every highway that crosses the Hatchie, there's two big communities of homes with the associated gas stations, uh, convenience stores, car washes, car washes, you name it, that has taken good ag land, but it's also right on the banks of the floodplain of the Hatchie. And if that, and in 30 years without some intentional thought, it has to be intentional. We can't assume the Hatchie is going to take care of itself. Without some intentional thought, the worst case scenario is all those houses and all those businesses are right on the banks of the Hatchie and that they're they're putting all their affluent and wastewater straight into the floodplain with no kinds of control, no kinds of regulation at all. That would um, that would be a serious problem. So two things. Um Folks need to start enjoying the Hatchie. And a lot of people hearing about this for the first time and saying, I didn't even know about the Hatchie. You know, everybody around here sees the signs and knows about it. So um, that and then also, you know, what they need to join your organization and, and go to your website and look at some of the things that, that folks are doing. Throw the throw the URL out there again. 
hatchyriver.org. So hatchyriver.org. And again, we'll put the link down. If you're driving, don't, don't have a wreck writing it down. We'll uh, put it down in, in the show notes. Um, and then what else can people do? One of the things that uh, we're just starting a partnership with Protect Our Aquifer, a group based in Memphis, but they're also spread out across the entire area of the, wa- of the aquifer. And for your listeners who may not know, we have literally the best water in the world almost here. It's, it's always classified as way up in the top of good, clean water. When I was a little kid, uh, the field trip was like to the water plant in Memphis. Oh, and I yeah. re- distinctly remember, I mean, I must have been in first or second grade. I distinctly remember when they tasted it, when we, we had little cups, like you, uh, little communion cups, and they said, taste the water. They said, this water began its its journey up from the aquifer uh, when the uh, kings were in Egypt. And, you know, they made it very dramatic for me. And I have never forgotten that no matter where I live in in the United States, I would always, when I would drink water, I would think about, I wish this was Memphis water. Memphis has the best water (laughs) in the world. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's right under our feet here. You know, we're the recharge zone and we use that same aquifer. So I guess two things, worst case scenario, Besides what you see on top of the ground with the Hatchie River and urbanization, a worst case scenario, we begin to break through the into the aquifer and either pollute the aquifer or mm. bring the aquifer down in an unsustainable fashion and eventually lose that lose all that good water or change the quality of that water. So what people can do first, I think, is is to appreciate water. Don't don't take it for granted. Uh, it, not everybody in the world can turn on their faucet and get a glass, good glass of water out of their uh, out of their sink, which we shouldn't take that for granted. And then, I mean, the other thing to think about is a river by nature of what it is and how long it is. Things that happen, you know, in one section can absolutely destroy what's happening 300 miles down down the river, you know. Exactly. And that's that's the point about the urban development I was mentioning a second ago. Uh, aesthetically, the Hatchie may look the same. You know, you may drive across the highway bridge and it's like, oh, those trees are still there. The river's still there. But what's impacted is the biological diversity. It's as biodiverse as any river in the lower Mississippi River Valley. 35 species of mussel, over 100 species of fish, probably the most catfish species of any river in North America. There's 11 catfish species, Mm. which four are game fish, right? We all know those, or a lot of us know those, but the rest of the catfish are only about one or two inches long. They're mm. called mad toms, but they are catfish, and there are 11 species in the Hatchie River. Over 100 species of fish, uh, 250 species of birds. There's 60 species of dragonflies and damselflies, 60 species of butterflies. You know, it's just the list goes on and on. You know, it's over 400,000 acres of bottomland hardwood forest in the Hatchie watershed. It's, uh, it's an incredible resource, and the impact will be to that biological diversity and the ecological integrity. Uh, slowly, those species will start to disappear, and, they'll, and as more and more species disappear from the hatchie, that means the entire system will change. Yeah, you know, we've got um, up at Discovery Park, and, and I'm going to show you our new exhibit on Duck, Duck, Goose when we get, when we get finished talking, but um, we've got a case that's empty. It's a is an empty case, and it's supposed to be the Labrador duck. But the Labrador duck is a great uh, example of what happens if you take your eye off the ball. The Labrador duck is now extinct because it was overhunted, and uh, um, the carrier pigeon is another example. Passenger passenger pigeon. The passenger yeah. pigeon, yeah, is another example. Right. Um, you know of what happens if if you don't take care of the planet, things disappear and they don't come back. You know, one thing people are always uh, surprised and amazed by is that we used to have parakeets flying around here. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of parakeets as a tropical bird, but there was a species called the Carolina parakeet. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last ones in Tennessee were seen in in the Hatchie watershed, as a matter of fact, in the late 1800s. And then they too became extinct. I saw a very yellow bird yesterday while I was sitting on, right. my, on my back. What, what is that bird? Do you know? Like yellow and black? It was. It almost looked like a parakeet. Yellow and black. You just showed me what you 
about what the size is. Yeah, it was so, small. Uh, like a goldfinch, American that, goldfinch. Is that, is it, do we have those around here? We do. We I, do. My, my wife bought me a, a book, and I haven't I haven't used it yet. But we do have binoculars. <laughs> and we, we look for them, you know, and it's – and I'm also – here's the other thing. Here's the other thing I'm doing right now when it comes to birds. You can, you can guide me on this. So we have a ton of crows, and I've been trying to make friends with the crows. Um, I've been leaving peanuts out for them and shiny <laughs> objects and things, but I can't get my country crows. I think they're not used to peanuts. Maybe I can't get them. I can't get them to to uh, connect. I can't connect with my crows. Oh. Have, any, anything I need to do to make sure my crows um, become friendly? I think just stick it out. Stick it out. Just crows are it. among the most intelligent of all animals, and and among uh, certainly most intelligent of of birds i think west Tennessee think, crows are probably even smarter probably you know there's uh i've heard i don't crow hunt much but you know some people in parts of the country love to crow hunt and you actually go to a blind just like you're duck hunting mm -hmm. but you can't go to the blind and just stay there you gotta have a buddy go with you and then the buddy leaves mm. so that way so apparently the crows know that you're in the blind but if somebody leaves apparently they can't count so they thought that everybody leaves the blind, but they know enough to know that you're still in there and they're watching. What do they do with crows after they shoot them? Do they uh, eat them? No. Well, <laughs> no. Oh, no, not literally. At well, least. it um, it has been fun because we have, you know, I did finally get a few of them to start trying them out. I watched them, you know, pecking on them and everything. So anyway, so that's yeah, my stick it out. Stick it out. With, I bet they'll with West Tennessee birds. Um. Anything else we need to know about the hatchie before we go and, and check out Discovery Park's exhibit on um, on ducks and geese? I think uh, I think the main thing is that the Hatchie River Conservancy, HatchieRiver.org, we're here. We're hopefully here to stay. As you said, there's been lots of efforts in the past. We are here to stay to conserve the ecological integrity and natural scenic beauty of, of the Hatchie River and its watershed. Three areas, conservation of land and water, communications and education, and then promote low-impact outdoor recreation. One of the things about education is I wanted to mention, if folks are driving through Brownsville, Haywood County on I-40, pull off at exit 56. The Delta Heritage Center has an entire room dedicated to Hatchie River and Hatchie River conservation. There's another uh, museum, Tipton County Museum, that'll have an exhibit up sometime this fall, sometime this summer running through the fall about the Hatchie River and the Hatchie River Conservancy. So there's a lot of opportunity to learn about the Hatchie. And if you learn about the Hatchie, you'll definitely start caring about the Hatchie. And if you care about the Hatchie, then we'll conserve it for a long time. Fantastic. And thank you for being here with us today. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Scott. What a wonderful place to be. And thanks to all of you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. 